Hello, and welcome to this brief tutorial on active learning for support vector machines. This tutorial can also serve as a brief introduction to active learning if you're familiar with machine learning but you haven't seen active learning before. I'm going to assume some basic familiarity with SVMs. You don't have to remember the specifics of the algorithm or the derivations, but you should be familiar with no notions such as the margin. I should mention that this is based on uh, work by Tong and Kohler in a paper from 2001. Um, and there might be more recent work on active learning for SVMs, and I'm sure there is, but I think this paper is enough to get a good idea what active learning is all about and how it can be applied to SVMs. So first, let's see what active learning is. So here we, you see that we have a basic classification problem where we're trying to classify the triangles from the circles. And we see that, for example, this is one linear separator that does this. And in this case, the data is indeed linearly separable. Um, and then, so the question is, what are these question marks? And these question marks are where active learning comes in. So in active learning, what, what we can do is, um, these question marks, first of all, are unlabeled data points. So we have, in addition to our labeled data points, like these circles and these triangles, we have a set of unlabeled data points that we, ha we might have some procedure of getting a label for. For example, in some applications, we might be able to ask an expert. And in other applications, maybe we can design an experiment that gives us a label for those data points. But this is probably costly, so we can't do it for you know, all the data points. Um, maybe we can only do it for a few data points. And um, we want to do this to improve our prediction for other data points in the future. So the act of learning is about which data points should I choose, which unlabeled data points should I ask for labels for, in order to get the best um, learning gains in the future. And you might already have some intuition for how some data points are better to query than others. For example, we might notice that it seems like a really poor choice to query this data point, but it's almost certainly going to be a circle. If it's a triangle, we're sort of in trouble. Um, so it's better you're better off you know querying about one of these three data points. And throughout this um, presentation, we're going to actually formalize some of this intuition. So now I need to define something called the version space. And this is actually a very um, simple concept. Basically, it's, um, it's a set of all functions in our hypothesis set that satisfy this condition. And all this condition is saying is that the sign of the label, and here, actually, I should mention that we're assuming our label is either plus one or minus one, uh, that the sign of the label and the predicted label, the true label and the predicted label, are the same. So essentially, it's uh, the version space consists of all functions that linearly separate the data. So. So now is a good time to mention that I'm going to assume that the data is linearly separable in the feature space. So we're here we're doing kernel SVM, and the kernel um, implicitly or explicitly maps the data into a into a feature space. And in that feature space, which might be very a very high dimensional or even infinite dimensional, the data should be linearly separable. If this assumption isn't true in practice, we can um, make some alterations to the algorithms to make it work. So so now, given that the data is linearly separable, we actually have a version space, and that consists of all functions that linearly separate the data. So before we can move on, we should uh, recall the notion of duality in SVMs. And normally, when we think of a classification problem, we treat the data points, in this case, data points in the feature space, as points in the feature space. And we treat the weight vector as hyperplane, well, actually, the weight vector is normal to the hyperplane, but we draw the hyperplane uh, in the feature space because it shows the um, classification between the two sets of data points. The dual form of this is that we can actually treat the weight vector as a point, and we can, in you know, in a different space, the weight vector is a point because you know it's a vector of numbers, and each of the actual each of, the, each of the transformed data points in our feature space now in this new space are represented by hyperplanes and of course um, the this is a toy example and it's not going to be accurate but we can for example imagine this red circle is represented by this red hyperplane and this green triangle is represented by this green hyperplane and so on and visualizing things in this dual form can be useful because we note that now this enclosed area, which is enclosed by these four um, hyperplanes, is going to be the version space. So any point in this white area here would be a valid weight vector. And notice that this blue line here doesn't actually play any role in determining the version space. 
And so this gives us a notion of um, the support vectors. The support vectors are the are going to be the hyperplanes uh, that actually determine the version space. And also under an assumption that will hold if we're using the radial basis function, for example, um, the weight vector that SVM outputs will be the center of the largest hypersphere that's with, enclosed within the version space. And the radius of this hypersphere will correspond to the margin. And this is, it's, it's almost intuitive, or it's, it's, it's sort of the correspondence between the two forms, the primal and the dual form, or it's, it's, it's sort of intuitive here. So now let's see how the version space is actually related to active learning. So recall that we're, we're going to consider this area here as our version space. And now remember that in active learning we have a set of unlabeled data points and we want to see which unlabeled data point to choose. So now realize that the version space, the smaller the version space is, um, the better it is for learning because we have less of a space to choose the weight vector from and we're more likely cho to choose the optimal weight vector. So now what does choosing a particular data point to query to get the label of uh, do to our version space? So let's suppose that this dotted line represents the one of our um, unlabeled data points that we want to query, that we want to get the label of. So what happens if we query this data point? So what ends up happening is that Either uh, we'll get a label of positive one, in which case this is our new version space, or we'll get a label of negative one, in which case this is our version space. So to choose uh, which data point we want to query, we want to choose one that shrinks the version space the most. And to be conservative, to um, be cautious about the worst case, we want to choose one that essentially halves the version space. Because if we choose um, a data point, for example, here, well, it might give us a very small area, but it also might give us a pretty large area. It's computationally intractable to actually compute the area of the version space, so we're going to have to go with some approximations. Here's a simple approximation called the simple margin algorithm. So uh, in this uh, diagram, this the white region is the version space, and uh, this is the largest hypersphere in the version space. And essentially, this algorithm relies on the fact that um, the center of the hypersphere is the weight vector that SVM gives us, so our current estimate of the weight vector. And we're hoping that this might be close to the center of the entire version space. So with the assumption that it's close to the center, we're going to pick the data point that's closest to the weight vector, because that will hopefully have or nearly have the version space. So in this, in this case, we'll pick B. So we're done, right? We found a great algorithm that can perform active learning. Well, not quite. The simple margin algorithm sometimes breaks down. Here you can pause the video to see what the simple margin might do. So here the ratio margin algorithm comes to the rescue. So in this algorithm, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of our unlabeled data points, or question marks, or in the dual form, each of these dotted hyperplanes. And for each of these, we're going to apply SVM twice. Once assuming that the label is positive one, and once assuming that the label is negative one. So recall that in the simple margin algorithm, we didn't apply SVM at all at this step. All we did was for each of these unlabeled data points, we found which one had the closest distance to the weight vector, and we simply chose that for active learning. Now we're going to apply SVM twice for each of these, which is much more computationally expensive. So why do we want to do this? We want to find the margin that results from each of these applications of SVM. And the margin here is proportional to these radii, um, but let's just assume they're the same thing as the radii. So we find find these margins, and then we want to take the ratio of the mar the two margins, the the margin for the positive one case and the margin for the negative one case, and we want to choose the data point that has uh, the mar margin ratio closest to one. Why do we want to do this? Because then in that case, that means the hyperspheres are closest in size which hopefully means that the version spaces are roughly equal in size. And we see that in this case, the algorithm will choose E. And in, in fact, if you look at the two, the way the version space is now split, see that the two parts are, are pretty close in size. If like the simple margin algorithm, we chose A, we see that the, well, first of all, the two version spaces are very different in size. And we see that also the, the largest hyperspheres had very different margins. So intuitively, it seems like the ratio margin algorithm would do a better job in most cases.
So there you have it. Now you can go and try active learning with SVMs in practice. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.